As you're turning there, um, I have a question for you. Uh, how many of you know what the Westminster Shorter Catechism is? Can I just get a show of hands? Okay, I see a handful of hands going up. Uh, the Westminster Shorter Catechism, as, as any catechism, is uh, essentially uh, a way of learning basic theology, a way of learning uh, a basic system of understanding uh, what the Bible is talking about. And the Westminster Shorter Catechism has its name uh, being shorter because there's a longer version uh, that it's, it's condensed from. Uh, but the first question in the Westminster Shorter Catechism is, what is man's chief end? And the answer is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Uh, the catechism takes the approach of question and answer format. So the teacher has a question that they ask, and the student has a memorized answer that they repeat back. And so the first question is arguably the most well-known. Um, I'm not sure if that's just because people don't get very far in the material or what, but uh, probably it has something to do with the fact that it is the, the primary question. It's the primary question that deals with why we are here. What is man's chief end? Another way to say that is what's our main purpose? Uh, what's the primary goal that humans are here for? Why are we here is another way of saying that. The answer, according to the Catechism, is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. Now, many of you are, uh, likewise, I know, familiar with John Piper and have read some of his books um, like Desiring God or Don't Waste Your Life. Those are a couple of his more popular ones. Uh, he, he takes this answer and he makes just one small modification to it, uh, which, is, which is quite significant. He says that the answer is to glorify God by enjoying him forever. To glorify God by enjoying him forever. Just switching out that word and to by. Um, I, I would encourage you to read either, either of his books uh, to learn a little bit more about why he's suggesting that. Uh, but my point today is simply to emphasize that the two are inextricably linked. Glorifying God and enjoying Him are two things that are inextricably linked. That's what I want to argue this morning from our passage, John chapter 15, verses 10 and 11. My proposition is very simple. Your joy will be full if you obey Christ. Your joy will be full if you obey Christ. Our text this morning is John chapter 15, verses 10 and 11. Let me read that for us. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. The outline this morning that we're working with is likewise simple. There's three components. The first part of verse 10 is the conditional. The second part of verse 10 is the example. And the uh, verse 11 is the result. So three main points, the conditional, the example, and the result. Before we, we jump in any further, let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this, your word, we thank you that you have revealed yourself to us. Uh, Lord, as we acknowledged earlier that we cannot reach you on our own, we also acknowledge that we would not know who you are without your disclosure of yourself, without your word that tells us who you are, that tells us that you have a plan of redemption if we will choose to trust in it. So Lord, we ask that your spirit would enable us this morning to understand your word. We ask that your spirit would open our hearts, that it would soften our hearts, that we would be willing this morning to turn from our own selfish ways and to follow you no matter the cost. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So let me give you some context on uh, these two verses uh, before we dive in and dissect them. Uh, John chapter 15, to begin with, falls within uh, what's referred to as Jesus' farewell discourse. So John chapters 13 through 17 uh, records a, a long discourse that Jesus has with his disciples in the upper room. It's what Jesus said to his disciples at the time of the Last Supper, what we just uh, celebrated together communion. Um, it's possible that this particular section, starting in verse 15, 
is after they've left the upper room. And the reason why we say that is at the very end of chapter 14, uh, the last sentence in chapter 14 says, Rise, let us go from here. Uh, so it's possible that, that this is an indication that Jesus and his disciples have finished uh, the Last Supper and now they have, have got up and they're heading off to the Mount of Olives, which is where the Garden of Gethsemane is, uh, before Jesus, Jesus is then um, betrayed and crucified, buried, resurrected. <clears throat> so what, what's important to remember about that is, of course, uh, no scripture is more important than others, uh, but in terms of Jesus' life here on earth, these are the last instructions that he gave to his disciples. This is the last consistent, consolidated time that he had with his disciples before he was, um, before he was crucified. So it, it is definitely an important passage, and it's what Jesus wanted his disciples to know before they left. So, taking the end of chapter 14 into account, it's very possible that this is something they've seen actually on the way to the Mount of Olives, or actually at the Mount of Olives. John chapter 15 is about vine, a vine and its branches, which, of course, is a perfect object lesson if they happen to see a grapevine on their way to the Mount of Olives, or actually on the Mount of Olives. Um, in either case, it's, it's definitely intended to be an object lesson. It's intended for uh, Jesus' disciples to hear and to see what this metaphor means. So let's read, if you would stand with me, I'm going to read John chapter 15, verses 1 through 10 to give some context. Please stand with me. We're just going to read this passage so that we know what Jesus was talking about. John chapter 15, verse 1. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered and thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. You may be seated. Now this metaphor that Jesus uses with his disciples of a vine and, a branches, vine and its branches may not immediately speak to you and me because I suspect most of us have not ever tended to a grapevine. Uh, and in this area, even, even if you happen to be a farmer, it's probably not vines that you are tending. So if you'll permit me, I'd like to use a modern metaphor to explain an ancient metaphor. John, you can just turn me off on the monitors. That'd be fine. Um, so, what I want to use as a metaphor is a vacuum cleaner. Believe it or not, a vacuum cleaner. That's what Jesus is talking about here. Uh, no longer is Jesus the vine and his disciples the branches, but rather, Jesus is the wall outlet and his disciples are vacuum cleaners. Okay, stick with me. <laughs> Imagine. Maybe you don't have to imagine, but imagine that you've just bought a brand new vacuum. You take it in your house, you take it out of the box, you set it in the middle of the room, and it just sits there, right? It does nothing. It does not do what it was intended to do. It simply sits there. What do you have to do to make it functional? You have to plug it in, right? You have to give it a source of energy. You have to give it a source of power for it to do what it was intended to do. And what I'm suggesting to you is that's exactly what Jesus is describing to his disciples. A branch by itself 
does not do anything. It dies, that's what it does. But a, a branch that is grafted into a vine now has a power, now has a source of energy, of nutrition, and can actually grow and it can accomplish its intended purpose, which is to bear fruit. So with that sort of in your mind, uh, let's look at the first part of verse 10, which is the conditional. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. This conditional comes right on the heels of a command in verse 9. Verse 9 says, abide in my love. That word abide is a command. It may not sound like it in English, but it is. Uh, abide in my love. And so I think what Jesus is doing here is he's answering a question that was likely on the mind of his disciples. You just told us to abide in your love. How, how do we do that? What does that mean? How do we abide in your love? And he says, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. He gives them the answer. The answer of how is to obey what Christ has said. This is very similar to just one chapter earlier. John 14, 15 says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Very similar idea here. He has the parts uh, switched around, but essentially the idea is that love and obedience are linked. Love and obedience are linked. Note, however, that this is a conditional. There's an if in verse 10. Verse 10 starts with an if. It's not assumed that you or I will keep Christ's commands. In fact, the opposite is assumed, right? What is Romans 3, 9 through 12? I'm sure you know Romans 3, 23. All have sinned, fallen short of the glory of God. What about right before that? Romans 3, 9 through 12. For we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. As it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside, together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. The default is to not keep Christ's commands. The default is to not keep Christ's commands. Everyone here this morning is in one of two categories. Either you're a follower of Christ or you aren't. If you're not a follower of Christ, then no amount of obedience is going to matter. No amount of obedience is going to gain you anything. If you're not a follower of Christ, obedience is meaningless. What you need is what Jesus says in John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The action point for anyone here this morning that has not put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ is to do exactly that, to put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Romans 10.9 says, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That is what gets salvation. Not obedience, but belief in Jesus Christ. Another way to indicate this is right here in our passage that we read, verse 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Apart from me, you can do nothing. But if you're in that other category this morning, and you are a follower of Jesus Christ, then this if is for you. This if is for you. Because likewise for you, it's not assumed that you will be following Christ's commands. Remember, Jesus is talking to his disciples when he says this. In verse 8, Jesus says that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. Note still that Jesus is not saying that his disciples earn their salvation by obedience. What he's saying is that they demonstrate their salvation by doing good things, by bearing fruit. It's just like this vacuum cleaner sitting in the middle of the room, right? You can flip this power switch all you want, but until it's plugged in the wall, it's not going to turn on. What comes first is being plugged in to the source of power, the source of energy. That's what comes first. Just like a branch is not going to bear fruit on its own apart from a vine, it has to be hooked in to the vine first to get its source. You and I are the same way. Good works don't get you eternal life. They simply prove that you already have it. They prove that your source of life is not yourself, but it's Christ. They prove that you have salvation. 
So if you're a follower of Christ this morning, then you are just like a vacuum cleaner plugged into a wall. You're just like a branch that's hooked into a vine. The question that's before you is, will you obey what he has commanded? Will you obey what he has commanded? Let's look at the example that Christ gives, gives us. It's the second half of verse 10. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in him. I'm sorry, and abide in his love. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. So here is the example that we are to follow. It's that of Christ. Specifically, it's that of Christ obeying his Father's commands. And this, of course, prompts a very natural question. Did Christ have to earn his Father's love? It's not a trick question. The answer is no. Christ did not have to earn his Father's love, just like any son does not have to earn his Father's love. It's there by virtue of the relationship. It's there by virtue of their relationship. Christ did not have to earn his Father's love. We see this in verse 9. As the Father has loved me. Something that's already there. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Christ did not have to earn his Father's love. He had it. However, Christ did prove that he loved the Father by what? By his obedience. By obeying. Again, chapter 14, verse 31. But I do as the Father has commanded me, so that the world may know that I love the Father. Christ proved his love for the Father by his obedience. As our example, he's asking us to do the same thing. So what did it mean? Because this example also says that Christ abides in his Father's love. What did it mean for Christ to abide in his Father's love? Essentially, I think there's three things from this passage that uh, are entailed in that. Uh, if you look broader at the New Testament, you could probably come up with a whole long list of things that it meant for Christ uh, to abide in his Father's love. But from the standpoint of this passage, there's three main things. First of all, he knew that his Father loved him first. He knew that his Father loved him first. That's another way of saying he knew that his source of life was his Father. Second, he knew his Father's words. He knew his Father's words. That we see clearly in John chapter 12, at the end of John chapter 12, verses 49 and 50. For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me has, has himself given me a commandment, what to say and what to speak. And I know that, this, that his commandment is eternal life. What I say, therefore, I say as the Father has told me. Christ knew his Father's words. And then lastly, Christ kept his Father's commands, which of course is clear from our verse right here. So, what Christ then is commending to us as an example are these same three things, these same three components. First, that Christ has loved us. Again, verse 9, uh, so have I loved you. Christ has loved us first. Perhaps even more clearly, 1 John 4.19, we love because he first loved us. We could continue, verse 3, John 15, 3. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Already, it's already happened because Christ has made it happen. Or verse 16 of the same chapter. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide. Christ's love came first. And that, as his disciples, is one of the things that we are to emulate. Christ knew that God's love came first. We are to know that Christ's love came came first. Secondly, we are to know his words. We are to know his words. Verse 7, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, and my words abide in you. It's right here. It's all right here. And this is not unique to us. Christ himself said he didn't make this stuff up on his own, right? He got his commands from the Father. He knew his Father's word, and that's how he knew, the third point, that's how he knew what to do. That's how he knew what to do. We are to obey Christ. Verse 10, again, keep my commandments. That component is very clear. So abiding in Christ's love is acknowledging that he loved us first. It's knowing his word, and it's doing 
his word. It's obeying what he has told us in his word. Now, you may be thinking that this is, this is actually just a clever way to reiterate the same old point. You should, you should be doing better. Uh, you should be obeying. Um, well, that may be true, uh, but, but you may also be thinking that this sounds like a lot of work, right? It's not that easy to keep everything that's listed in this book. Well, the first thing that we just need to clarify is it's true that following Christ is not a walk in the park. This is why Matthew 16, 24 says, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, which is not jewelry, that's an instrument of torture, take up his cross daily and follow me. Obedience can often hurt. I'm not denying that this morning. But what we do also need to realize is that following the word of God, obeying is how, is simply, it's how God created the universe. Following God's commands is how God created the universe. 1 John 5, 3 says, For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. They're not burdensome. There's at least four reasons. Again, we could probably enumerate a lot, but, you know, we don't want to be here for too long. Uh, there's at least four distinct reasons why God's commands are not burdensome. The first one is that it's the Spirit in us that does the works. It's the Spirit of God in us that does the works. Chapter 14, verses 16 and 17, reiterate the point, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth. He's talking about the Holy Spirit. Again, in verse 26 of chapter 14, also in chapter 16, verse 13, he talks about the Spirit. Galatians 5, 16, Philippians 2, 13 are just a few of the places that indicate, that underscore the fact that the Holy Spirit is the one working in and through us to do these works. Again, the vacuum cleaner plugged into the wall, where is its energy coming from? It's coming from the wall, not from itself. It, sure, it does something with the, with the energy, but it's not coming in and of itself. So first of all, the commands of God are not burdensome because it's the Spirit in us that's doing the works. Secondly, they're not burdensome because they are our life. They are our life. They're for our good. Did you catch that in the scripture reading this morning? Deuteronomy 10.13, to keep the commandments and the statutes of the Lord, which I am commanding you today for your good. For your good. Or earlier in Deuteronomy, chapter 5, verse 33, you shall walk in all the way that the Lord your God has commanded you, that you may live and that it may go well with you. The Old Testament reiterates this over and over and over again. God has given us commands for our good, for our life. It's not because he's a killjoy. It's because he knows that this is the route to life. This is our life. Third point, this is how God built the universe. I don't know if you've ever stopped to think about it, but God's moral laws are actually not too different from his natural laws. Natural laws, like the law of gravity, which of course is not really a law, right? It's simply a description of how things optimally work. Well, guess what? His moral laws are a description of how things optimally work. You can break the law of gravity just like you can break God's moral laws. It's not as common, but the result is the same. Eventually, you're pulled down. He's given us these laws because it's simply a description of how things ought to be. It's a description of how things work best. The fourth point, which is right here in our text, is that obedience brings joy. Obedience brings joy. That's the third point on our outline, the result. Let's read verse 11. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. Now the phrase, these things, that refers essentially to verses 1 through 10, uh, what we have just read. And in summary fashion, this is what verses 1 through 10 say. Abide in me, just like a branch abides in the vine, let my words abide in you, bear much fruit, just like a healthy branch that's been pruned, abide in my love, and keep my commandments. 
In summary fashion, that's what verses 1 through 10 say. So when Jesus says these things, what he's referring to is this procedure, what he's just told his disciples. He's saying, if you do these things, then my joy will be in you and your joy will be full. Another way of saying that is the result of following the procedure that Christ has outlined is receiving Christ's joy and receiving his joy to the fullest. <clears throat> so, of course, we should ask the question, what exactly is Christ's joy? And perhaps, you know, do you want it or not? Is that something desirable? What is Christ's joy? Well, I like to think of Christ's joy as real joy. I like, I like to think of Christ's joy as real joy. You see, it's easy for anyone to be joyful when they get what they want. It's easy for anyone to be happy when they have the things that they need and that they desire. But real joy is joy that persists in the midst of suffering. Real joy is joy that does not dissipate at the first sign of heat. Real joy lasts. Real joy is what Christ had. Real joy is what Job had. Remember the story of Job? Partway through the book, he's lost everything. Job 13, 15, what does he say? He says, though you slay me, still I will trust in you. Though he slay me, still I will trust in you. That's real joy in action. That's real joy through suffering. That's real faith through suffering. Christ had real joy. Hebrews 12, 2 says, Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Now, let's not misinterpret that. Christ was not looking forward to the cross. He wasn't looking forward to crucifixion. He was looking forward to the glory that he knew this would bring his Father, the glory that he knew this would bring himself, the salvation that he knew it would bring to us. He was looking forward to the result. Christ offers us, offers us a joy that can command anything. He offers us a joy that can persist through anything. Remember our memory verse from over a year ago now, Psalm 1611? You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand there are pleasures forevermore. That's the psalmist saying that the word that God had disclosed up to that point, the path of life, you make known to me the path of life. That's not God whispering in his ear. That's the word, that's the commands that God has given. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy, and at your right hand there are pleasures forevermore. If you obey, then you will have Christ's joy. As we move towards a conclusion this morning, mostly what I've been arguing is that your joy will be full if you obey Christ. It's pretty simple. Your joy will be full if you obey Christ. It's, in it's interesting because joy is actually the best motivator. Joy, uh, brain science is finally catching up with what the Bible's been saying for centuries. Joy is the best motivator. There's, I, I, I don't know how much you read, but there are several books out there now on brain science talking about the differences in what you might call your autopilot. Uh, your brain functioning just through everyday life is processing tons and tons of stimuli and it's identifying things that are different. It's identifying anomalies so that it can let your consciousness know. If you think of driving down the road, uh, when do you recognize that there's something in front of you? Well, it's actually after you've recognized that something is in front of you because your autopilot system says, hey, that doesn't look right. And uh, many, uh, many books use the analogy of an elevator. So the base floor is your autopilot. They identify something's wrong and they send it up to your consciousness and you can say, oh, hey, I need to slow down or I need to turn or, or do something along those lines. Um, but what's interesting is uh, there's a book called Rare Leadership, uh, which, which I'd encourage uh, any of you to read. Rare Leadership. And 
his main point in this book is that joy is the best way to lead people. Joy is the best way to lead people. Uh, and he's using a certain amount, not too much, but a certain amount of brain science to back that up, as well as, of course, the Bible, which has been saying this all along. Uh, let, me, let me read a little quote from this book. Um, this is from the book uh, Rare Leadership. Level one, so that's this base layer of the elevator, the autopilot, is the attachment center. This is the deepest part of the brain. It's the most basic thing about us. The attachment center lights up when we feel like being with someone. As I, Marcus, the person writing this, sit at the coffee shop, uh, I am with my 24-year-old daughter. Her cell phone rang, and I watched her jump up from her seat. Oh my goodness, I can't believe it's you. That's the best impression I can do, sorry. Uh, <laughs> there was total joy on her face uh, and in her voice as she greeted a friend from college. S just seeing the name on the cell phone triggered <clears throat> her attachment center to light up at the expectation of this joyful connection with her friend. The attachment center is all about relationships. Its greatest pleasure is joyful attachment. Its greatest pain is relational loss. Our deepest need and our most desperate craving is joyful relationships. As I'm sure you know, people will do crazy things in the pursuit of a joyful relationship. They will leave the ministry, abandon their families, run up their credit cards. The most common problems at level one are addictions. We ignore joy at our own peril. He's making a similar point that Christ is making, actually. And that is the fact that as we obey, as we bear much fruit, we will experience Christ's joy. There is joy in a healthy relationship with Jesus Christ. That love and that joy that Jesus is speaking of in John 15 is available for you and for me. It's something that we can have. It's something that he offers. It's something that he offers first. Christ has loved us first. It's the basis of this joyful relationship. Just like a branch connected to a vine experiences much joy as it bears much fruit because this is exactly what it was intended to do. It's exactly the same with us. When we are connected to Christ and we bear much fruit, we have much joy because we're doing the one thing that we were intended to do. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for this word from John chapter 15. And Lord, while there may not be incredible new insights here, the truth is that what you offer to us is your love, your love which can inspire and maintain joy in us throughout no matter what we experience. Lord, I pray that each of us here would know and have that joy. I pray that we would turn to it each and every day. I pray that we would rest in our relationship with you. I pray that we would acknowledge, we would know that your love has covered all of our sin and that we are free to serve you, as Paul says in Galatians. Lord, we pray that you would make us fruitful, that you would use us wherever you have us, that you would use us to share your word so that others might know the same joy that we have. We pray all of these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.